Welcome to 3 Avian Sabbath School panel. My name is John Dinsey, and when we say panel, that means there are panelists, and I am happy that the 3 Avian family is here, part of them, and I'd like to introduce to you, to my left, Sister Gio Morricone. Welcome. Thank you, Pastor Johnny. I have Monday from the Power of the Grave. Amen. Power of the Grave. We have Pastor Ryan Day. How are you, and what day do you have? I am blessed as can be. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled, From the Depths of the Earth. Mm. Oh, looking forward to that one as well. We have Pastor James Rafferty. How are you doing? Are you ready? And what yes. day do you have? Good to be here, uh, Pastor Johnny. I have Wednesday's lesson, and it is entitled, Your Dead Shall Live. Mm. Amen. And Sister Shelley Quinn, what day do you have? I have Thursday, those who sleep in the dust, and we're just so glad that you're joining us. Amen. Amen. Well, this Sabbath School panel depends on prayer and God and the Holy Spirit. We're going to ask Pastor Ryan Day to lead us into prayer, please. Absolutely. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, as always here on Sabbath School panel, we depend yeah. completely on you, Lord. We recognize that mm -hmm. our finite minds are just limited, and we recognize that we are solely dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us through this study. So pour out your Spirit <laughs> upon this panel so that each and every one of us can teach according to your word and according mm -hmm. to your will. And may our viewers and everyone involved in studying, Lord, may we all be drawn closer to our Savior, Jesus Christ, because of this truth today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Well, we are in the Sabbath School Quarterly entitled Life Everlasting, Death, Dying, and Future Hope. This is lesson number four. And the title for lesson number four is The Old <laughs> Testament Hope. I begin with Saturday's portion, and we do have a memory text. It's coming from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 and 19. By faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. Mm -hmm. he, who had, he who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son. He considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone from the dead, and figuratively, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. So the Saturday portion tells us that the Old Testament hope is grounded not on Greek ideas of the immortality of the soul, which, by the way, many people believe today that the soul is immortal. But the biblical teaching is that there will be a final resurrection of the dead and that the soul does not live eternally. The Bible says that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And this lesson, we are going to reflect on how the notion of the final resurrection is unfolded in the Old Testament. And we're going to look uh, at Job, uh, some of the psalmists, and the prophets Isaiah and Daniel. Sunday's portion is entitled, I Shall See God. This focuses in on Job. And we go to Job chapter 1, begin reading there. And the Bible says, there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, this is uh, from the King James Version. I'd like to read to you the New King James Version to see a little difference. And it says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the phrase uh, in the King James, it says perfect. And the New King James, blameless and upright. This means that he lived a life that brought honor and glory to God. His desire was to please God and be faithful to Him by obeying His commandments. So did Job consider himself perfect? There is an answer in Job chapter 9, verse 20. And it says, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. So Job did not consider himself perfect. He considered himself a servant of the Lord. Now, the Bible makes it clear in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, like Noah, you can say that uh, when God looked upon the earth, he would say, Job found grace in his sight. Uh, we find later that God tells Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that he is uh, faithful and upright? And, uh, of course, 
This is God's testimony of Job because he knew Job. Let's take a look at this idea that he shunned evil. Mm -hmm. The idea of shunning evil is that he turned aside from evil. Mm -hmm. He decided not to participate in evil and he chose to be faithful. Let's go to Job chapter 1 verse 2 and uh, Job and says, And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Everybody knew Job. Everybody knew that he was a person that also helped other people. As you read the book of Job, you can notice that he endeavored to help others. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that he kept all his wealth to himself. Whenever he saw a need, he tried to help others. Now, when we look at Job, you know, the, uh, the lesson actually, the lesson makes a statement that when you look at Job, he tried to serve the Lord, but suddenly things began to happen to him that perhaps, you know, in the, in the time that Job lived in, and even during the time of Christ, people consider that when someone was going through a difficult time, oh, that person is committing a lot of sins. Look how God is punishing this person. Mm. But... The, uh, what we see in the book of Job chapter 1 is that behind the scenes, there is a challenge that Satan brings to God and says, if you take away all those things you have given him, he is going to curse you. And so the Lord allows the devil to cause calamity to come upon Job and his family. And we see that the lesson brings out that Job uh, suffered physically, his body was ravaged by painful disease. Job chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. Materially, he suffered. He lost large portions of his livestock and properties. You can see Job chapter 1, verse 13 through 17. And within his household, he lost his servants and even his own children. Yeah. Painful experience mm -hmm. to yeah. go through. Job chapter 1, verse 16 and 18 mm -hmm. will tell that. And emotionally... Emotionally, he was surrounded by friends who accused him of being an impenitent sinner who deserved what he was facing. In mm -hmm. fact, Job had to call them miserable comforters. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had any miserable comforters <laughs> in, your, in your experience of life. Sometimes it seems like you're going through a difficult time and you're looking for a word of hope. And somehow Satan comes, puts some thought in somebody's mind and carelessly probably without thinking, probably without desire to injure, they say something to you that adds to your grief and adds to your pain. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's important to keep our eyes on the Lord and remember that He loves us and He is near. So when we're going through trouble, we begin to question, why is this, why is this happening to me? Uh, look at Job. When you look at Job chapter 3, verses 1 through 26, and we're not going to be able to read all of that because of the lack of time, you will see that Job regretted even his birth mm. and uh, wished that he had never been born. Mm. He was suffering intensely. Yeah. And this is why when you look at Job, you ask yourself, well, where is the Old Testament hope for Job? It is amazing that this man, after going through so much difficulties, through so much trial, even seeing his children die, losing practically everything, yeah. he still trusted in the Lord. Look at Job chapter 13, verse 15, the statement that has become encouraging to so many people. Though he slay me, yeah. yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. So even though he slay me, I will trust him. You know, it's interesting that uh, some of us suffer just a small percent or a small portion of the things Job faced. And we're already at the point of saying, God doesn't love me. He's turned his back on me. Even a small portion. And, and this is, this is a, a, an example we have here of a person that even though he was suffering through all of these things, he continued to trust in the Lord. Amen. He didn't turn his back in the Lord. Even, uh, even the difficult part of your own loved one saying, if his wife said to him, you still hold your integrity, curse God and die. Mm. Uh, apparently what she saw was so much. I mean, she experienced also the loss of her children, mm -hmm. but she was not apparently afflicted physically as Job was. There's no record of that, but she also suffered seeing all of these things happening and it was too much for her. Curse God and die, she said to Job. But Job 
Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I now turn your attention to Job chapter 19, verse 25 and 26, because herein lies the reason why the title for this day is I shall see God. It says in verse 25, for I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Amen. Wow. Praise yeah. the Lord. Awesome. What an in inspiration Job is that going through all of these things, he knows my Redeemer liveth. And in the latter day, in the latter day, I shall see God. Now, what is Job saying here? He's, you know, it's interesting what he says, because in the book, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, it brings out a statement that we need to be made aware of. It says, for who alone, talking about God, has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light to whom uh, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. And I add another amen to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what is this idea that Job said he will see God? The only way he could see God is because of Jesus Christ. And this is why I bring you now to John chapter 1, verses, uh, beginning in verse 14. Mm -hmm. And it says, And the Word became <laughs> flesh and yes. dwelt among us. We beheld his glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Mm -hmm. And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Notice verse 18. No one has seen God at any, any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Mm. We see in Jesus His life on earth. We see how God is. And He is a revelation of God. God, the Bible says, God manifests in the flesh. And so we praise the Lord that because of the sacrifice Jesus made for us, we also, like Job, can see God. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. Praise the Lord. We are now children of God. <laughs> and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Notice, we shall see mm -hmm. him as he is. We will be then have been purified. Uh, because the Bible says in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, we shall be transformed. This mortal shall put on immortality. And this corruption shall put on incorruption. And we will be fitted and made capable to see God. Mm -hmm. And it says in verse 3, and everyone who has this hope in him, purifies himself just as he is pure. By the grace of God, prepare yourself to see God. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so goodness. much, Pastor Johnny. That was rich. That was powerful. Amen. You see, in the midst of Job's suffering, uh, hope. Hope. Hope in Jesus and hope in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. As we look at hope in the resurrection from the Old Testament, we're going to Psalm 49. I have Psalm 49. We'll be reading almost the balance of this psalm. It's the last Korahite psalm in the collection. Now, the Korahites were Levites. They were descendants of Kohath. They were appointed by David to be musicians in the sanctuary service. And interestingly enough, this psalm is not directed to God. You know, if you read the psalms, a lot of them are directed to God. This one is addressed to the community of faith. Mm. And we're going to study it. And he answers the question of where do we place our trust in the face of death? 
and we're all going to face that. Where do we place our trust? It contemplates the transience, as it were, of human life apart from an understanding of God. Now, I love literary things, so we're gonna take just a little side note for just a moment and look at the lyric poetry of the Psalms. You know, Hebrew poetry is not sound rhyme. A lot of Western poetry is sound rhyme, mm -hmm. but Hebrew poetry is thought rhyme. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of parallelism as you read in the Hebrew. And I, there's three main types that they talk about, and you can see some of this in the psalm as well unpack it. There's a synonymous parallelism, meaning the first line and the second line kind of echoes the first or says the same thing that the first line says. Then we have an antithetical parallelism where the second line says in contrast or opposite to the first line. Mm. Then we have a synthetic parallelism where the second line completes and enlarges the thought of the first line. So let's look at this Psalm 49. I divided it into four sections and we have seven takeaways, Pastor Johnny, <laughs> in these four sections. We have the introduction, that's section one. Section two is the futility of human wealth and possessions. Section three is the most important section. It's on death and hope in the resurrection. Verse 15, I think is the most important verse of the entire Psalm. Then uh, the fourth section is the futility of humankind. Mm. So let's start at the first section. This is the introduction. We're in verse one, Psalm 49, verse one. Hear this, all peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world. This is that synonymous parallelism where the second line echoes. It says the same thing that the first line said. Takeaway number one, when God speaks, listen. It's super important. Hear this, all peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world. So whatever's coming in the Psalm is important. God is speaking and we need to pay attention. Verse two, both low and high, rich and poor together. Takeaway number two, when God speaks, it's for everyone. It's not just for one class of people or a caste. It's not just for one group, it's for Everyone, what's coming in this psalm is for everyone. Verse three, my mouth shall speak wisdom and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will disclose my dark saying on the harp. Now we jump over to section number two, which is the futility of human wealth. And we go to verse five. Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of the riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. So what are they saying here? Those who trust in their wealth. What about position? What about power? What about wealth? Maybe that's going to help. It's not going to help. It's not going to make any difference. Take away three, wealth, power, position cannot save. Mm -hmm. What does it say here? None of them, if you have wealth or power or position, you can't redeem someone else. You can't save someone else. You can't help some, someone else. Verse eight, for the redemption of their souls is costly. It is, it costs mm -hmm. the blood of Jesus. Right, that's right. And it shall cease forever. Let's jump down to verse 10. For he sees wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the senseless person perish and leave their wealth to others. Did you catch that? The fool dies, the senseless person dies, but so does the wise men die. Mm -hmm. All die. Takeaway number four, death is no respecter of persons. Mm. Now you might think this Psalm is a little morbid, but it's going to get good. <laughs> That's coming in verse 15. Death comes to all, comes to the wise and the foolish, the senseless, as it said, or the wise person. It comes to the wealthy and the poor. Mm -hmm. Death is no respecter of persons. Verse 12, nevertheless, man, though in honor, he does not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. It showcases literally the transience of human life apart 
from God. Mm -hmm. Now we get to my favorite section. This is section number three. We have death and then we go to hope in the resurrection. We're in verse 13. This is the way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve their sayings. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. This is the death part. Death shall feed on them. What are they saying? There is no physical, mental, or spiritual activity in death as the body decays in the grave. We know that when we die, Pastor Johnny already talked about the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We know mm -hmm. the soul is not immortal. And that when we die, when that breath is gone and the body decays in the grave, there's no mental thought, there's no emotion, there's nothing. It's like an unconscious sleep. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. That is a reference to the resurrection, which is coming. Mm. And their beauty shall be consumed in the grave, far from their dwelling. Takeaway number five. The things we value often come to nothing. What we think is important... All they say, what do they say? All that glitters is not gold. What we think is important, what we think is valuable, what we think matters, it doesn't matter at, at all. Mm -hmm. Death shall feed on them. No matter who we are, That's no matter right. what we possess, everything will come to an end. Verse 15, it, how does it start? It says, but mm -hmm. God. Hmm. Oh, I love that. Okay, here's death feeding on the bodies. Here is no matter our position, no matter what we did, no matter anything, death, we're in the grave. That's right. But God, it doesn't stop there. The grave is not all there is. Death is not all there is. So this life of sickness and suffering, which eventually will end in death, is not all there is. But God, mm -hmm. oh, I love that. But God will redeem. Literally, God will ransom. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. <laughs> God will redeem mm -hmm. my soul from the power of the grave. Yes. So we're resting in that unconscious state. Remember, soul is body plus breath. So what's God going to do? He's going to resurrect. He's going to bring the breath again. Right. He's going to resurrect the body that's resting in the grave. Mm. God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. We don't have yes. to fear death. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope over loved ones who have passed away. But God will redeem our souls from the power of the grave. Here we see promise of the resurrection mm -hmm. in Psalm chapter 49. Takeaway number six, our hope for salvation, our hope for redemption, our hope for resurrection, and by extension, eternal life, it's in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's not in riches. It's not in power. It's not in position. It is in God himself. That's right. Finally, we get to the last section, which is the futility of humankind. It goes a little depressed again. Mm. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. We're in verse 17. For when he dies, he carries nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lives, he blesses himself. For men will praise you when you do well for yourself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. He shall I'll never see the light. Mm. So what do we take away? Takeaway number seven. Appearances can be deceiving. Who we think should be honored, mm -hmm. who we think should be admired, is not always as it appears. What do I take from Psalm chapter 49? I take that wealth, power, position, none of that saves. Mm -hmm. None of that matters. Death is no respecter of persons, but God reaches down to you and I, and he says, I can redeem, I can save, I can resurrect you from the power of the grave. Mm. Amen. amen, amen. Well, I'd like to say for those that are watching and listening, would you say amen with me? Amen. 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 Well, the blessings are not over. They continue. We'll be back in just a moment. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. 
Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back. Lesson number four, the Old Testament hope continues with Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Denzi and Jill. I got to keep that same energy. You got the energy going, so we got to keep it going. Praise the Lord. It was a beautiful, beautiful message on Psalm 49. And now we're going to go over to Psalm 77. That's what uh, Tuesday's, lessons call for, Tuesday's lesson calls for, which is entitled From the Depths of the Earth. And of course, this is a psalm from Asaph. Asaph is, is pouring out his heart. And actually what he's doing is he's going back and recounting. He's looking at his life from his youth all the way up to old age. And he's looking at how how just wonderful God has been to him, how faithful God has been to him. Uh, but yet we're gravitating toward this point that the lesson brings out, which is he talks about being brought up from the depths of the earth. Yeah. So we're going to start there in verse one. And I love how, you know, you read the verses. I like to read the verses too, because we may have someone watching right now, Sabbath school panel for the first time, or someone who's not familiar with Christianity or the Bible, and they're hearing these verses for the very first time. So I like to read through them. So if you have your Bibles, okay. Psalm 71, verse 1. And of course, I love how he starts this out. In you, O Lord, I put my trust because that can really be a summation of the entire Bible right there. God simply wanting his people to trust in him. But he continues on in verse 2. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. I love that. Deliver me in your righteousness. He's not depending upon his own righteousness. Amen. He recognizes, Lord, I'm, I, I need your righteousness. Mm -hmm. And then he continues in verse three, be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. Mm. I love that continually. We have to continually depend on God. <laughs> you have given the commandment to save me for you are my rock and my fortress. And then verse four, deliver me, O God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For you are my hope. There it is again. O Lord God, mm -hmm. you are my trust from my youth. Now mm -hmm. he goes back and he's saying, wait, I'm looking all the way back to my youth now. <laughs> and he's emphasizing that God has been with him from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And verse six, he continues on with this, this youth concept. By you, I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be, there it is again, continually of you. And in fact, I want to jump down to verse 17 of Psalm 71 here, because again, he emphasizes this again by saying, oh God, you have taught me again from my youth and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Uh, you know, th that's important that we, again, the Bible emphasizes this much uh, that we should raise up our youth in the way of the Lord. Mm. Obviously, Asaph had that relationship with God from his youth and he's recognizing that God, you've been with me from the very, very beginning. Mm. But then he goes on in verse seven and he says, I have become as a wonder to many, mm. but you are my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with your praise mm -hmm. and with your glory all the day. So notice how the dependence is completely on God. The emphasis is on God, not himself, not his righteousness. He's completely dependent upon God. And yet mm -hmm. he says, I will, I will declare your praise. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say in verse nine, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. I love this because now he's transitioning to the older age. He's saying, Lord, I'm, I'm getting old and you know, I, I, I don't want you to be far from me. It seems like the older we get, the more this life just batters us and breaks us down. <laughs> mm -hmm. And sometimes, yes, many people in their older age, they've just been through this life. This life has just tore them down inch mm -hmm. by inch. And it's hard to stay connected to the Lord. You get discouraged oftentimes. And now he's saying, Lord, don't, don't let that happen to me mm -hmm. in my old age. I want you to remain connected to me. Mm -hmm. Again, verse nine, do not cast me in the time of my old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. Verse 10, for my enemies speak against me and those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together saying God has forsaken him. Pursue and take him for there is none to deliver him. Mm -hmm. And then verse 12, oh God, do not be far from me. Oh my God, make haste to help me. You can see he's pouring his heart out and he's saying, God, I recognize that in my old age, the enemy is after me more than ever. Mm -hmm. He's The walls are closing in 
on me, but Lord, I'm still putting my trust in you to see me through to the end. Now, let's transition now down to verse 18 because time is of the essence here. But he goes on to say in verse 18, he says, now also when I am old. So he goes back to this old age. He's again taking a, a survey of his life and he's recounting God's faithfulness from his youth to his old age. He says, but now also when I am old and gray headed, oh God, do not forsake me mm. until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to Amen. come. I love this because he's saying, you know what? Don't forsake me. I, I, I'm, I'm still here, Lord. I'm still your man. Mm. I want to declare your righteousness. I want to make you known to all of the generations around me. And then verse 19, also your righteousness, O God, is very high. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? I love that this brother has remained faithful to God even through his old age. And not only this, get this, and I actually have to emphasize this because I meet a lot of some of my elderly friends mm -hmm. who have this idea that, well, I'm, I'm old and you know I'm not as young as I used to be and I can't get out there and declare the Lord as I used to be, so we'll leave it to you young folk. Mm -hmm. Asaph is setting the record straight. No, 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 <laughs> my work's not finished. I want to still declare your works. I can still be a witness for you, oh God. Mm. And here comes the emphasis, the, the verse that we're really gravitating towards for the, for the theme and the purpose of this lesson. Verse 20, it says, You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again. Again, speaking to the end of his life, he's now old and great headed and he's saying, Lord, I'm still your man. I'm still here. But we know, Lord, he says, you shall revive me again. Notice, and bring me up again from the depths of the earth earth. Yes. Now here's what the lesson brings out, which I thought was really, really cool, that you can actually take this two different ways. You can take it in the literal sense mm. in regards to the fact that we all know that we're getting older. This life breaks us down. Mm. We're, we're, we're hanging on to the mighty righteousness of God mm. all the way through as much as we can. And we're hanging on to that hope that God is going to bring us up from the depths of the earth. If we do expire in this lifetime and we find ourselves again uh, asleep in that grave, that God will bring us up from the depths. There's that literal aspect that can be applied here. Mm. But the author also brings out that there is a metaphorical application as well. And he uses a couple of texts to support this. Psalm 88 verses 1 through 6 brings out again using the same language up from the depths mm. to prove the fact that it can be used in the literal sense. I'm in Psalm uh, 88 verses 1 through 6. He says, O Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried out in the day and the night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul soul is full of troubles and my life draws near. And here comes the context clues to the grave. Verse four, I am counted with those who go down to the pit. pit. Okay. The grave, the pit, the earth. Okay. Uh, I am like a man who has no strength. Verse five, adrift among, there it is, the dead. And so these context clues, uh, even verse five, this is like the slain who lie in the grave. So, you know, as you're gravitating towards verse six, it says, you have laid me in the lowest pit in darkness in the Depth. So there again, from the depths, this is the literal application that we understand that we're looking forward to the fact that the Bible promises us that if we remain in Christ, if we remain faithful to him as he is faithful to us, that he will lift us from the depths of the grave, mm -hmm. literally. But then when you get to Psalm 130, again, just an example, Psalm 130 verses one and two, now he uses the depths in the metaphorical sense because it says, out of the depths, I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice, lift your ears to be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the lesson brings out beautifully here, and I, and I love this, that in this sense, and what we see in here in Psalm 71, Asaph is, is metaphorically crying out. He's saying, Lord, uh, in, you, you shall revive me again. Bring me up from the depths of the earth. This is talking about the valley of the shadow of death. This is talking about that oftentimes in this life, we hit that rock bottom. We may hit some low places or we may go through the trials, the crucibles, the difficulties in this life. And sometimes it'll bring us down. But not only can, does God have the power to lift us literally from the grave, but he can also also lift us from that metaphorical grave, the metaphorical depths. Mm -hmm. God has our back 
And there are endless promises uh, in, in God's word that we can lean upon to know that mm-hmm. God is there for us, just as he was uh, for Asaph all through his life. Mm-hmm. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. For he himself, I'm just going to read through these really quickly. For he himself has said, I will never leave you That's nor right. forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Who, what can man do to me? I love that. Uh, Proverbs 18, 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 41 verse 10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous yes. right hand. God has your back and he will lift you up from the depth that you might have fallen into. Keep your trust in the Lord and your eyes on Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ryan. That was a powerful lesson in Psalm 71 and Jill Psalm 49. Learned a lot about Psalm 49 and John, Johnny, um, Job chapter one and and onward. The promises that we have in the Old Testament of the resurrection, that seems to be our focus. I have Wednesday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty and the title is Your Dead Shall Live. So again, it's the same basic theme. We're looking at the Old Testament for the resurrection hope. And in Wednesday's lesson, we're gonna be contrasting the resurrection hope with the future of the lost, the future of the wicked. And we're going to be looking in Isaiah chapter 26. I just have two verses that we're going to be looking at here in Isaiah chapter 26. The lesson brings these verses out in contrast. Isaiah chapter 26 verses 14 in contrast with verse 19. So if you want to open your Bibles there, we're going to look at Isaiah 26 verses 14 in contrast with verse 19. Verse 14 says this, they are dead they shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Hmm. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them Hmm. and made all their members to perish. So that's the first verse. And this is talking about the wicked, lost, those who have no faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. Hmm. And then we want to move to verse 19 and we're going to see the opposite. Hmm. Verse 19 says, thy dead men shall live together Hmm. with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. That is such a powerful verse. Mm -hmm. And there's so much here when you think about, thy dead shall live together with my dead body. (laughs) Who's that talking about with my dead body? When you think about that. I think about Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christ is the first fruits Mm -hmm. of those who sleep in him, the Bible says, who who are dead in him. Mm -hmm. And... Thy dead men, those who have faith in me are going to live along with my dead body. My dead body's resurrected. It's alive. It's resurrected. And those who have faith in me will live. And it says that the dew that's upon them, you know, the, the dew that settles upon the ground, of course, that's where people are buried in the ground. The dew is like herbs. It's like herbs. You know, it's, it's actually, in a sense, it's actually an herb is, 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 is something that nurtures us, that is good for us, that we right. take, you know. So in other words, there's nothing in the ground and nothing in this earth that is actually an enemy of those who have their faith in Jesus Christ. Right. Mm-hmm. All of That's those good. who put their faith in Jesus Christ are going to have this resurrection. All of them mm-hmm. are going to be have this hope in contrast with the lost. And so the lesson brings out here that the book of Isaiah brings us the hope of the resurrection, but it's broadened significantly, right? Mm-hmm. Previous Bible allusions to the resurrection were expressed from personal perspectives. Job, it was a personal perspective. Psalm 49, it was a personal perspective. Psalm 71, it was a personal perspective. But the prophet Isaiah is speaking of including himself and the covenantial community of believers. Mm, Isn't that a beautiful thought? I'm just reading right from the quarterly right now, okay? Isaiah 26 contrasts the distinct destinies of the wicked and the righteous. Mm. On the one side, the wicked will remain dead without ever being brought to life again, at least that is after the second death. Okay, we understand the second death is gonna be that moment of judgment of punishment. And that's Revelation 21 verse eight. They will be completely destroyed and all their memory will perish forever. Isaiah 26 verse 14, the quarterly goes on. This passage underscores the teaching that there are no surviving souls or spirits that remain alive after death. Speaking about the final destruction of the wicked, which comes later, the Lord stated elsewhere that the wicked shall be completely burned up, leaving them neither root nor branch. And the author is quoting here from Malachi chapter four and verse one. They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Now on the other side, 
The quarterly goes on to say, the righteous dead will raise from death to receive their blessed reward. Right? Isaiah 25 highlights that the Lord will swallow up death forever, will wipe away tears from all their faces. So Isaiah has already been talking about this theme in the previous chapter. So on Isaiah chapter 26, we find the following words, your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. So all the resurrected righteous, that is all the resur resurrected righteous are going to participate mm -hmm. in this joyful feast that the Lord will prepare for all people, according to Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6. The final resurrection will bring together all the righteous from all ages, including all of the beloved of the Lord and your beloved ones who put their faith in Jesus Christ. All of us are going to be there. All of those who've already died <laughs> in Jesus Christ are going to be there. So it's really powerful when you think about this because if you could imagine if we didn't have any hope, if we didn't have any assurance, if there was no reason to think that our dead ones uh, had anything beyond the grave, but that the grave was the end for them. Can you think of what that would be like? Mm -hmm. There's just hopeless. nothing. It's just over. Yeah. That would just be hopeless. If we didn't believe in the resurrection, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we would, would be of all men most miserable, right. most hopeless, mm -hmm. right? But even so, God has a resurrection and all of us are going to partake in that resurrection. So what I loved about a little bit of what you were sharing there, Jill, and, and moving into Psalm 71 and then Psalm 77. No, let me see. Psalm, 70, Psalm 73, Psalm 71, okay. Psalm 73. Um, it talked about the position we have on planet Earth. We have wealth, we have power, we have education, we have prestige, we command, you know, respect. All of that means nothing yeah. Yeah. in the context of the new heavens and the new earth, in the context mm -hmm. of the resurrection. All of that means nothing. David struggled so much with this. I'm thinking about it in Psalm 73. It talks there about the trials that we face. <laughs> Job faced these trials, mm -hmm. and I think Job would have loved to be able to read this psalm because Job faced these trials Truly God is good to Israel, it says in Psalm 73, verse 1. Even to such are of a clean heart, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps were well and I slipped. For I was envious at the foolish, verse 3, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there were no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men, verse 5. They're not plagued like other men. They have pride that can, surrounds them like a chain and covers them like a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than the heart could wish. They are corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth up, verse 9, against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Mm -hmm. This is a description yes. of what's happening yeah. in our world today. It's always been happening, but you see it now more than ever. You know, when you look at the Bible, what you're actually seeing there, especially as you study prophecy, is not just a culmination of the character of God's people being perfected and brought to harvest, but you also see a culmination of the character of Satan's people, of the devil's people, and they're coming to a harvest too. And David is wrestling with this. He's yeah. wrestling with it until he says, if you follow this down now and go all the way back to verse 17, Psalm 73, 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I understood their end. Mm -hmm. How yes. foolish was I, he says. Surely thou hast set them in slippery places, verse 18. You cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one wakes, verse 20. So, O Lord, when thou wakest, thou shalt despise their image. My heart was grieved. I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I'm continually with thee. Thou hast upholden me with thy right hand. Mm. David, the psalmists, all of God's people look past this present life mm -hmm. with its sorrow, with its pain, with its rewards, with its mm -hmm. blessings. They look past this present life and they looked to the reality that God has promised in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and that's why we are to say with Job, though he slay me, will I trust in him. Yeah. I will see him, though this mm -hmm. body is ravaged, though mm -hmm. it lays in the grave, it will come forth. And this is the beautiful contrast we see mm -hmm. in Isaiah chapter 26, verses 14 and 19. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 26, 14, 
14 and 19 are the key verses that help us to see the contrast. If you had no other verses on the resurrection, the hope that we have as believers versus the, the future of those who don't believe, those two verses would settle the whole thing for us. And friends, we're praying that you will take those two verses and you will lay them in front of you and you will put your hand on the verse 19, not the verse 14, not the verse for the wicked, but the verse for the righteous. You'll put your hand on that verse and you'll say, this by the grace of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, this is going to be my future. Amen. 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 I just have to tell you all what a joy it is to Amen. sit on this panel with you and listen and learn. It's so exciting when we have time to really go in depth in God's Word. I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Thursday's lesson. And the title of the lesson is Those Who Sleep in the Dust. You know, it's so interesting. We clearly see in the Old Testament, the concept, the doctrine of resurrection mm -hmm. was firmly established. When we were talking about Job, Job lived before Abraham. Job wasn't a Hebrew, but when he said in Job 19, 25 and 26, I know my Redeemer lives. And even if my flesh is decayed, I know I'm going to see him in the flesh. And then you've got Abraham who was willing to sacrifice his son. And I love this. Listen what the New Testament says. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, his only begotten covenant son of promise. Mm -hmm. And he says, in, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, get this, verse 19, concluding mm -hmm. that God was able to raise him up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when he went up there to offer Isaac, what did he say to the guys that were the two that were with him? Mm -hmm. Stay here. We're going to go worship. We'll come back. We'll come back. So we'll come back. And he did. But now here's the interesting thing. Here we've got resurrection. Mm -hmm. Isaiah, Psalms, uh, all through the... Uh, Genesis. When we see this, what happens is during the 400 years, the intertestamental time from Malachi to Matthew, you know what happens? The Pharisees, the sect of the Pharisees rises up and they are hair splitting legalist. Mm. They are only <laughs> on the, the books of, of Moses and they just, they're progressive and they keep coming up with new ideas and new laws. And then they kept writing more things to do this, but they swing so far to the right that then you've got the Sadducees that rise up. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, this is human nature. Mm. You get somebody way off here and the pendulum's going to swing the other direction. So the Sadducees arise. And you know what? Now, they're, they're more of your wealth. They, they come from the priestly families and stuff. They do not accept the resurrection. Mm. They refuse anything that's supernatural like angels. So you've got two totally opposing groups here and it's so amazing. But let's look at what Jesus said. When in John eleven twenty four, 24, this is actually Martha speaking because mm -hmm. this is after Lazarus died and Jesus comes to her and he's talking with Martha and Martha says, speaking of her brother, and she, her brother Lazarus, speaking to Jesus, she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew it was going to be the last day. Jesus obviously taught that too because mm -hmm. Martha was very close to Jesus. But what she was wanting at the time was more immediate relief, wasn't it? Yeah. So there's no question that the Jews had knowledge of the resurrection. Yes, the Sadducees uh, refused to believe it. But what we're going to look at now is Daniel chapter 12. I love this verse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel's talking about this great time of great trouble, but he says, at that time, mm -hmm. Michael shall stand up. Mm -hmm. Now, most 
Bible scholars believe Michael is another title for Jesus Christ because he says, at that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Well, Jesus is called the Prince of Princes, the Prince of the Hosts, so that's why they believe. You know, there's only one archangel in the Bible, mm -hmm. and, and he's only mentioned twice, as a matter of fact, but we believe that's a title for Jesus. But he continues, and listen to what he says. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And Jesus told us this in Matthew chapter 24. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 24, 21, Jesus says, There will be great tribulation such as not been seen. Now, he's talking about at the end of the... They're saying, when are you coming? What are going to be the signs? He says, Great tribulation such as not been seen from the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, mm -hmm. none. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then he continues in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will... Uh, be shaken. And he says, then the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Now, wait a minute. He's saying nobody would be saved if I hadn't cut it short. All of these things are going to happen. It can't, you know, all of this pre-tribulation, this idea that we're going to escape and go to heaven and miss all of this, that's a lie. And if you believe that lie, you're going to be in trouble when these last times come. So Jesus is saying all of this tribulation happens and then the Son of Man will appear in heaven. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Nobody's going to miss this. There's no secret. He descends with a shout and he says, every eye will see me. He's going to flash like the lightning from east to west and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Mm -hmm. You know, and Daniel 2, 12 says, at that time, your people shall be delivered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone who is found written in the book. What book? If you're new and you don't know what book he's talking about, he's talking about the book of life. I love what Moses uh, in Exodus chapter 32, God had made a covenant with Israel after He brought them out. He redeemed them, brought them from bondage. They broke the covenant. Moses is begging God to renew the covenant. And he actually, in a Christ-like manner, he says, Oh, Lord, if you can't forgive them for what they've mm -hmm. done, he says, blot me out of your mm -hmm. book. And here's what God says. Exodus 32, 33, the Lord said to Moses, no, you're not going to stand in as their substitute. I'm paraphrasing. Here's what the Lord says. Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. In Revelation 20 and verse 12, this is at the resurrection and it says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and books. This is the second resurrection. The resurrection of the righteous has happened. And, and Revelation says that the second group doesn't come up until the thousand years mm -hmm. are past. But he, he says, I saw the dead. This is the second resurrection that's coming up to condemnation because Jesus said in John 5, 28 and 29, don't marvel at this. The day is coming when all who are in their graves mm. will hear my voice. That's right. Some will come forth to the resurrection. The righteous come forth to the resurrection of life. But then he talks about the second resurrection. And he says, the wicked come forth to the resurrection of condemnation. Well, that's what Revelation 20, 12 is talking about. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second 
death. So here's the point. I'm not going to get through all my notes, but the point is the tribulation happens before the thousand years before Jesus comes, we're going to have to walk through it. And we've got to hold on to him because he who has promised to complete the good work in us is faithful and he will hold on to us. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. the Lord. Well, this is uh, lesson is almost done, but we would like to have a final comment from each one of you, starting with Sister Jill. Um, I had Psalm 49 from the power of the grave. The pivotal verse is verse 15. It starts, but God. Do you need a mm. but God moment in your life? Do you need resurrection power in your life? I don't mean literally, although we will eventually need that, but maybe spiritually, maybe emotionally, you need that resurrection power of God in your life. Know that He can redeem you from the power of the grave. Amen. Uh, you know, I'd originally made a mistake in saying that we were studying Psalm 77. It was corrected to Psalm 71, and I'd mentioned the name Asaph. Psalm 71 doesn't indicate who that is, whether it's Asaph or David. Uh, but I do want to bring out the fact that that psalm is that 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 chapter is so powerful, and it reminds us that God has our back. Mm -hmm. And I just love, I want to read Joshua 1, 9 here. God says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Mm -hmm. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Put your trust in Him, and He is with you wherever you go. Amen. Amen. And I had uh, Isaiah 26, and Isaiah 26 was this transition that we were making from individual resurrection to corporate resurrection, including the Gentiles. So God has given his promise of resurrection, not just to those who are part of his people, part of his church, but to every single individual. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That means you're included in the resurrection, resurrection hope. Put your faith, belief in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And I just want to encourage you toward the end of time, Daniel 12, 3, here's what he says. Those who are wise, that's those who are holding on to righteousness by faith in God. He said, shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and turn many to righteousness. That reminds me of Philippians 2 and verse 15, where Paul says, become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine like the stars in the heaven as you hold forth the word of life. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I'd like to read to you from uh, Sister White, letter 97 from 1895. Notice this is marvelous. It says, we must not think when we are afflicted that the anger of the Lord is upon us. God brings us into trials in order that we may be drawn near to Him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. This lesson has been interesting, inspiring, and a blessing. We hope you will join us next time. The next lesson, number five, Resurrections Before the Cross. We'll see you then.